These aren't the stories your mother told you. No, these are the other stories. <laughs> It's important to us at The Other Stories to approach every story with sensitivity and respect for all cultures and backgrounds. This episode contains historical language and references that are considered offensive, including outdated terms for Native American individuals. Listener discretion is advised. The Other Stories proudly presents Swift Bear and Laxon, Chapter 3, Beyond the Hillbilly Horrors, written by Richard Reynolds and narrated by Justin Fife. They called him Swift Bear. His own people turned their back on him on account of his being some sort of freak of nature, faster than any horse born and the strongest some bitch I ever seen, prone to visions as heathen bear god putting him on track of unnatural abominations, meaning nothing but harm. I go by Mark Laxon, previous no-good cur, but seeking redemption, I partnered with old Swift Bear to roam the land and hunt creatures from Satan's own asshole. On this occasion, Bear's foresight led on I was in for some sort of awakening, a step closer to understanding this crazy world I'd stumbled on. Or some such horseshit to that effect. That boy frequently don't make a lick of sense. We was wandering round some backwoods hillsides, a place called Scaria Springs. Bear looking for signs of trouble. Me leading my horse, Thunder, who, educated by past experience, I'd seen fitting to load up with provisions and excessive firepower. I was hoping we didn't run into no locals. I just don't like these hill folk. I was telling Bear, coming up from their coal mines with their strange ways, crazy on shine, fornicating with their daughters and sisters and mamas and such. These people have told you this, or you have seen it? Asked Bear. Not directly, I says, but you hear things, don't you? You understand men of all kinds do the bad things you speak of, yes? Bear says. Well, uh, shit, Bear, why you always got to stomp over my opinions with your damn sense? I'd lost Bear's attention, though. A sound of shuffling was coming from the shadows afore a woman come stumbling into the light, gurgling and covered in blood. She come closer, falling into my arms, and I see she was throat cut. What's done this to you? I asked, but she couldn't form the words. She were too damaged. Bear were already going through our packs. He grabbed some of his medicine pouches and passed me some rags. Cover the cut. Contain the blood, he says, as he took herbs from this pouch and that, mixing them in a bowl before striking a match and putting flame to them. They caught fire and let off a thick green smoke, which Bear put under the woman's nose and instructed her to breathe in. As she did... Her struggle and lesson, till it seemed like she was in no pain at all. Bear took her from me and sat her up. Bolt upright she was, staring out, trance-like, as he cleaned and wrapped her wound proper. Lady, I says, waving a hand in her face, you know what it was come after you? She cannot talk, Bear says, but we can know what she knows. The great bear has shown me that it is now that you must look beyond. Beyond what? This, he says, gesturing at what I assumed was everything. A dream bear talked to you and told you to show me beyond? I questioned, skeptical. The great bear does not talk. It communes in thought and idea, he answered. How'd you know they ain't just your own ideas? I says. A sound query, I thought. They are, he says, like I was missing something obvious. Boy, I ever tell you, you don't make no sense. Yes, he says, 
handed me a bowl of charred herbs, which during our discussion he mixed with water and was urging me to drink. I drank it down, misgivings and all, immediately feeling peculiar. My mind felt like it was kind of growing outward. Things didn't look right. I moved my hand, and it left a blurred streak of itself in its wake, which, which didn't fade. My every move left a permanent impression. I looked at Swift Bear, who was nodding at my understanding. You're getting the smallest glimpse beyond. Your mind is not bound. You are not just you, and time is more than you knew. Can you see me through her? He says, pointing at the woman, and I knew what he meant. I closed my eyes and touched her mind. I was seeing Bear and me through her eyes. I moved her arm and saw it was leaving a streaked impressions through time, as solid looking as a sculpture, but I could move back through it nonetheless. You see time from a different vantage, Bear says, but look harder. See it for what it is, as definite as the ground. And I, I seen he was right. From here, time had a structure made up of the movement of everything, everywhere, ever, ever passing through it. I could focus and see the smallest parts of what made up air, and everything besides, each bit leaving its own blurred wake, so that everything there was seen to be made from never-ending tangles of thread. It were no different for people. I looked across the woman's wake, leading back to the shadow she stumbled from. Then I figured that I was in the wake and looked on to the streak of her that would go from here. And I understood that the body was just a channel through time that our minds traversed and saw the old world through like a boat being pulled down river. But what if we could sail up river? Bear nodded approval and I pushed my mind up river the woman's life. My vantage folded on itself and I saw the world as normal, but moving backward and speeding up. We launched up into my body's waiting arms and breathed out herb smoke, jerked in pain and sucked blood to our neck, pulled away from me and stumbled backward into the shadows. Faster and faster I raced back her life till events were just a reverse moving blur. Then they were. She, we, were at home weren't more than a shack, really, and she was fretting as she wrapped up her invalid ma and waited on her man coming home. When he did, he was filthy, stunk of booze, and looked mean as a gator. Again, I get in from work and ain't no food on the table, he shouted. It ain't like that, Joe. We need to get out of here. I've been hearing strange noises from the woods. The Jensen's gone missing two days back. The Thompson boys yesterday. He slapped her across the face. I tried to give him a whooping, but I was just a passenger on this ride. You gone touched, woman? Ain't nothing out there but forest critters. He was winding up another slap when a deep growl came from outside freezing his ass cold. Then the door was shoved open. <laughs> well, come in, look like a big man, but it were all hairy all over, with thick thighs, clawed hands, and powerful jaws. Two more followed. Lord, save me! cried Joe, placing himself behind us. In a flash, two of the beasts had pounced on the invalid mother, tearing her up and eating the meat in a frenzied gore. We screamed, then noticed the leader closing in on us. Then we was pushed from behind. As we stumbled toward the, the beast, it slashed our throat and spun and grabbed Joe, who was making for a run for the door. <sighs> Threw him to the groundward, grabbing up a leg and twisting his foot till the ankle broke. He was still screaming when it dragged him off. 
holding our neck to stem the blood. We looked over at poor Ma being mauled. Then we made a break for it. I'd seen what I needed and my mind lost grip on the woman's, shifting back to the me and now. I flailed and lost my senses beyond, it leaving behind only a memory residue like farts after dinner. I wanted to express the heartbreaking loss my new understanding. Now just out of my mind's grasp, but all I did was haul a fucking wolf man's. Weren't hard finding the woman's home. We dropped her at a neighbor's house and convinced him to get to town for the woman's medical needs and their own safety. We had our starting point now. The monster hunt was on. I know stuff about werewolves, I says as we tracked. Ain't we gonna need silver? Bear frowned. White men make up rules for their monsters. Imaginary weaknesses. Iron, salt, silver. Some need invitations, even. Perhaps it makes you feel safe, but any monster can be beat the same as any man. They're just stronger, rarer. So, bustling up until they quit moving. Got it. What you saw are children. Follow us. There will be a father bigger and stranger, he explained. They looked all grown to me. He paused to think how better to explain. A dark spirit from beyond the beyond can't possess a creature, change it unnaturally, grow inside. This new creature can infect others with its essence to make followers who in time grow to dark spirits of their own. I weren't following them exactly, but I got the gist. So that part's true? You get bit, you become one? Bit? Started bare, but were cut off by a growl come from the darkness, then more. And three hairy figures stepped into view. Thunder grunted, mean-like, as I pulled my pistols and bear's bone knives. One of them moved, and I put four bullets in his chest, dropping it to its knees. Its friends roared and advanced. Bear ran head-on, dodging their swipes and slicing them both deep. I kicked the one I shot onto its back. It snarled as I put the barrels of my dragoons to its eyes and emptied the bastards and terrible shrieks of pain coming echoing through the woods. I recognize them as Joe's. Help the man, Bear shouted as he fought. I'll finish these. That asshole Joe could perish for all I cared, but it'd be another monster to kill if and when he were infected. So I mounted thunder and followed the screams. I come to a clearing where the screams were piercing. In the shadows, Joe's struggling figure looked like tiny next to the hulking creature that were accosting him. It must have been nine foot tall, and it weren't no wolf. With its bushy tail and puffed up jaws, it looked more like a ginormous squirrel type monstrosity. And it weren't mauling him either. It were... Shit, I ain't gonna pretty it up for you. It were fucking him up the dirt shooting. The way Joe was screaming... He'd be staying fucked. Quick as I could, I took my roller shooters off of Thunder, loaded sawn off scattergun, pocketed some shells, and loaded rounds into my 87 Winchester. The monstrosity howled as it blew its load, letting go of Joe as it pulled out glistening Johnson that put old Thunders to shame. Joe lay spent for a time and started fitting out. I pumped around into the Winchester, finally getting the monstrosity's attention when I took my shot and hit it in the shoulder. I hardly noticed. It was iron Thunder, and its cock got stiff. It moved at the horse, but Thunder weren't having none. He spun and bucked and cracked its head a good one, dazing it enough for me to take up my sawn off and blast it point blank in the face, tearing away fur and meat, 
exposing skull and front teeth bigger than my feet. It screeched and stumbled back. Thunder moved to the clearing edge, snorting and stomping, but didn't bolt. That there stallion had fire. Joe hollered as his limbs flailed all spastic, his bones and muscles crunching as they changed under his skin. The monstrosity turned on me, moving in fast. I grabbed the Winchester, pumping and blew a hole in its belly. It didn't give a shit. It lifted me by the neck and screeched in my face. I pumped and shot down, hitting leg meat and staggering at some. Then a blur of movement come from nowhere, and Swift Bear was stabbing holes in the thing, moving and spinning away from its slashing claws, cutting it every which way. And I choked, then Bear was on its back. He had yanked its head back and was cutting its throat, then again. The monstrosity dropped me and tried to shake Bear, its throat gushing blood, but Bear kept at it, stabbing and cutting at the grizzle and sinew. I went for my scatter gun, loading two shells and shouted for Bear to get clear. Then I jammed the barrels into the mess's throat gore and fired. The neck exploded and its head then body fell to the ground. Bear wasted no time. He cut it throat to stomach, broke and yanked it at ribs till he found what he sought. He pulled out a fist-sized maggot-looking thing, tearing it away from the thin tendrils that held it in the monstrosity like an organ. This, I knew from experience, was a dark spirit, which a bear referred to previous. He cut it in two and stomped it to mush. If the spirit leaves, it may possess again. Always kill the spirit, he told me. Yeah, how about this asshole? I says, pointing to Joe, now unrecognizable, spouting hair all over. Bear grabbed his head and twisted it near off. No child of a dark spirit must live, or it will eventually turn worse. This would be some instructive day. I never heard bears talk so much, though I, I wasn't understanding half of it. The tracks speak of more children yet, he continued. Come, we hunt. And that we did for the rest of the night, killing us six more here Billy Squirrelmen. A job well done. Today's episode of The Other Stories was Swift, Bear and Laxon, Episode 3, Beyond the Hillbilly Horrors, written by Richard Reynolds, narrated by Justin Fife, produced by Carl Hughes with music by Roy Bush Band and Cube Sounds and Tom Robson, and sound effect provided by freesound.org. The episode illustration was provided by Luke Spooner of Carry On House. A quick thanks to our community managers, Joshua Boucher and Jasmine Arch, and to Joshua Boucher for helping with our submission reading. And of course to Ben Errington, the digital desperado, his content robbing us of our attention and stealing our hearts in the lawless territories of social media. Richard Reynolds is the owner and operator of Ground Zero Comics, a small shop in Mansfield, England, that writes, draws, and produces his own comics and strips <laughs> whenever he gets the chance. You can read these comics for free on the shop's website, groundzerocomics.co.uk, under the free comics sidebar. Justin Fife is a voice actor and podcaster. You can follow him on Twitter at, at JustinB5. The Other Stories is a production of the Story Studio Hawk and Cleaver and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. That means don't change it, don't sell it, by all means, share the hell out of it. Until next time.